Uh, the title of my talk focuses on resources, the future of oleochemicals in a resource-rich world. And I'd like to focus very much on the word resource because my first talk on the subject of resources actually didn't go too well. In fact, the audience did not react in quite the way I had anticipated. And it was all to do with these little guys, packets of salt. It was 15 years ago, and my daughter was eight years old, my son was four years old, and we went out, as we often do, to a uh, cheap restaurant, let's say a McDonald's or a Burger King, where inevitably they had little packets of salt and sugar and ketchup and so forth on the table. And, inevitably, the kids being the age they were would find endless hours of amusement playing with these little packets of salt. And uh, at the time, this annoyed me intensely. And I said, guys, come on, don't, don't play with the salt. This is a valuable resource for the restaurant. And uh, they're not here for, the, for you to play with. And in fact, salt, you know, if you look back, it can be mined from a rock salt mine a solution salt mine. It could even perhaps potentially be evaporated from seawater. And then once it's brought up out of the ground, this purification, this crystallization, this refining, this packaging, and then this transportation. There's a whole system to get the salt to the point of distribution. And then this repackaging into these small packets. There's even some branding, as you can see there. And it gets to the restaurant, and then the restaurant plans in a very detailed manner, how these condiments will be deployed, how much they need, how much per table, the wastage, the usage, and it's there to enhance the quality of the food and improve the customer experience and ultimately contribute to the profitable success and growth of this business. And so guys, it, it, it's not there for you to play with. And they looked at me. And my daughter said, Dad, it's okay. It's just salt. I said, all right, fair enough. I guess I'm not getting through. Two months later, my birthday comes around. My daughter gets for me a baseball hat, and embroidered across the front of the hat is the slogan, don't play with the salt. She said, <laughs> she said Dad, when we go out to dinner, you can just put this hat on, and we will look at it, and you won't need to repeat that lecture to us. That was my last foray into the subject of resources. I'm going to give it another go today. Let's take a look at perhaps the most widely tracked resource, and that's crude oil. This graph taken from the BP Oil World Energy Report for 2015 goes back to the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania, 1861. And you can see that, historically, the price has been quite low. Um, the graph doesn't take us all the way to the present day, so I put on there the red line, which shows today's crude oil price at about $47 per barrel. And so you can see that today oil is not necessarily historically cheap, although it is anticipated to stay at or around this level in the intermediate term. What I think is even more interesting is looking at reserves. So. Crude oil reserves, or proven reserves, as they are referred to, are tracked on an annual basis. So that this graph shows, in red, the total number of barrels of proven reserves by year since 1980. And the blue line shows the years of reserves that that represents at current levels of consumption. So you can see that back in 1980, Proven crude oil reserves were at 31 years. If that held true, that would mean today I would have to take a sailing vessel to get here. I'm not sure how else I would make it here without crude oil, because that all would have ran out in 2011. So interestingly, proven reserves have increased pretty much every year, and over that same period since 1980, the number of years of reserves have increased. So today, we're looking at around 50 years of proven reserves versus 31 years in 1980. So what changed in that interval? Well, actually, it wasn't the reserves that changed. 
In fact, if you think about it, the actual reserves decreased during that period. Because oil is not a renewable resource, and oil was being used during the period, the proven reserves increased. So what changed was the information. The information got better, and there was more of it, and that enabled us to identify more proven reserves. So what about palm oil? Palm oil, like any other resource, in my view, is all about energy and information. So let's take a look at pricing of palm oil versus a crude oil benchmark, Brent crude. Um, our colleague Jim Fry from LMC has made the point extremely well and successfully in prior years how in uh, the mid-2000s forward, let's say, uh, from the early to mid-2000s to the present day, the price of palm oil has become increasingly correlated with the price of crude oil. And if you look at that graph, you see, yeah, you could kind of see how that is, uh, is maybe the case. Taking another cut at the data, if you look at the ratio of palm to crude oil prices expressed in US dollars per ton, you can see over the period of the last 30 years or so, for the first half, for the first 15 years of that 30-year period, the ratio bounced all over the place. And it was at a level of around 2.95. Um, in more recent years, the most recent 15 years, you can see that ratio staying in a much narrower band of between 1 and 2 at an average level of about 1.33. So I took another cut of the data and said, well, what if we tried to correlate? What if we looked at monthly pairs of pricing data between palm oil and crude oil and see if we could draw a correlation? So again, looking at approximately the first 20 years' worth of data from 1985 to 2004, you can see there's pretty much no correlation. It's a scatter plot. Put a line, regression line through there, you get a very, very weak uh, basically no correlation, it's random. Look at the most recent 10 years worth of data from 2005 to 2015, monthly pairs of price data, and you can see there's a fairly tight correlation. And you can almost begin to look at Brent crude as something perhaps of a predictor of palm oil price. Um, and by the way, it's a little weaker, but more or less the same type of message there for palm kernel oil. You've got some crazy data points way up high over $2,000 a ton there, as many of you no doubt remember uh, from 2011, early 2011 time period. But again, there's a reasonably tight correlation. What that says to me is that uh, in terms of information, um, those of us in the palm oil market actually may have lost some information. Because in the late 80s, early 90s, all the way through to 2000, the price of palm oil said a lot about supply and demand conditions in the palm oil market. Whereas more recently, given the correlation we've just seen with Brent crude, the price of palm oil may actually be telling you more about the crude oil market than the palm oil market. And so I would suggest there's been an information loss in that regard because we've already got the price of crude oil telling us all we need to know about the crude oil market. Let's take a look for a minute at that other type of information, which is applications technology. I often encourage my clients to look at their business in this type of framework. Is your business production technology critical? Or is it application technology critical? Or is it some combination of the two? And you often find that businesses will line up in the following way if you look at the gross margins that are achievable from those types of business. Classic example I always love to give, laurel alcohol, product derived from palm kernel oil. Two major technologies available off the shelf, Lurgy and Davy. Some companies also have their own in-house technology. This is a production technology critical product. You go to a large alcohol user, the first question they're going to ask you is, what technology are you using? Well, I'm using Davy technology. 
Great, okay, we understand all about the product now. Send us a sample, we'll make sure it's okay, and then we can start talking supply and pricing, etc., etc. There's not a lot of applications expertise necessary to sell and market laurel alcohol. Consider this thought exercise. Are you going to go into, as an alcohol supplier, are you going to go into Procter & Gamble or Huntsman or Steppen and say, well, I have laurel alcohol here. Let me show you how to use it, because you may not know. Yes, I think they know how to use laurel alcohol. I think P&G's got that covered, believe me. You don't need to add a lot of technical applications value there. On the other hand, if you're in the area of lubricant additives, cosmetics actives, for example, aroma chemicals, it's not only the production technology that's critical, it is, you have to make the product. You'll not often get asked about it, or at least not as often as, what is the performance of your product in my application? Can you show me some data? Did you run a lubricity test for this lubricant additive? Did you run the ASTM corrosion standard for this additive? Did you run a flavor evaluation or a fragrance evaluation for this FNF ingredient? That application's technology becomes much more critical and it's a much different type of information than production technology. So what's the catch? Right, because then if it was that simple, we would all be in the specialties business. We would acquire the information. The catch is, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. You can't look up applications technology readily in a book. You can't find out pricing by buying a report from Platts or from Isis. You've really got to get into the field and spend the time talking to the customers and working with the chemists and putting together the formulations. And so the time it takes to develop that level of expertise is measured in decades. It takes 10, 20, 30 years to develop a presence in cosmetic actives or to develop that position as the go-to developer for Estee Lauder or L'Oreal that want a cosmetic chemical. To go to you to develop that chemical, you've got to be in that business for 20, 30 years and develop that, that level of expertise and that in-house institutional knowledge that you just can't buy on the outside. So that's the catch.